That was Jerry Haddon reporting there. Well, joining me now from Miami is Jacqueline Charles. She is the Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald. And she's just returned from Haiti. And joining me here in the studio is Melinda Miles. She spent the last 16 years working with various groups in Haiti. Ladies, thanks for joining me. Jacqueline, let me start with you. We just heard in that report that although 9,000 people have died from cholera, uh, the battle is still going on. Uh, there's still a great challenge. How big is that challenge? Well, it's a huge challenge because, first of all, we have to realize that when the rainy season comes, that's when you start to see the spike in cholera cases. But there has been research by a French researcher who says that Haiti can very well eliminate cholera, but that's going to require huge amounts of investment in water and sanitation. And that right now is still the battle in trying to get the international community to assist to provide the funding so that they can start to make those kinds of investments in potable water and in sanitation that will fight back with the cholera situation. Melinda, as Jacqueline points out, uh, cholera spreads through contaminated water. And we know that huge numbers of people in Haiti still don't have access to clean water. So how big is that challenge? It's a, it's a huge challenge, and we've seen over the last few years since the cholera epidemic began a number of different plans that have been rolled out, yet not one of them has been fully funded. So in the most recent major donors meeting, there was a conversation about raising $310 million to put proper sanitation and clean water in to stop the spread of cholera. However, as of today, it's only about $52 million funded. So until there's more will to put that money in and, and create those solutions on a national level, the cholera epidemic will continue. So there's two things you're talking about here. One, need money. The other, the will. Absolutely. And we've seen some solutions work on a grassroots level, on a local level. Um, there are ecological sanitation solutions, such as what's being promoted by Soil right now, which is a Haitian and American NGO. And we see it's working. It is preventing the spread of cholera when people have access to decent sanitation. They'll use it and, and happily. Uh, Jacqueline, UN peacekeepers are suspected of spreading cholera in uh, Haiti. As we just heard in our report, that Haiti has been cholera-free for 100 years. Uh, how has the UN responded to this? Well, the UN, interesting enough, um, you know, on this issue has chosen to focus more on trying to get sanitation. But I was in Haiti in July with UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And prior to my joining him on that trip, I had the opportunity to interview him in New York. And for the first time, he said that the UN has a moral responsibility, as well as the international community, to assist Haiti in this uh, cholera fight. But what victims want and what the lawyers who are fighting for them is to hear the UN take full responsibility. And that's what these ongoing lawsuits and court cases are about. Uh, just for the record, we did ask the United Nations to take part uh, in this show, in this program, but we did not receive a response to our request. Melinda, you've spent 16 years in Haiti. I mean, you've seen the devastation that this earthquake has caused. Almost five years have passed right now. Yes. What kind of progress have you seen in getting Haiti back on its feet? Well, there's definitely been progress. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it has been cosmetic. There have been a lot of opportunities, I would say, um, many of them have been missed, even from the early stages of emergency relief, opportunities to put in things like clean water systems, which could have prevented this epidemic we're seeing today. Instead, there was a lot of emergency relief that was very short term and short sighted. There were challenges in the coordination and a lot of that came from the fact that money wasn't going through the Haitian government or through Haitian based organizations that could have created more sustainable solutions. However, I would say there have been some positive signs as well. We see some infrastructure projects which are creating employment and we see a lot more conversation about supporting entrepreneurs and business development and creating jobs. Uh, however, there needs to be a more vigorous investment in things like education, things like basic health services so that people can survive and thrive. And unfortunately, we've seen um, a trend towards an open for business development model, which has focused on assembly factory jobs and industrial parks and also tourism development. Unfortunately, we're not going to see that raise the majority of Haitians out of the poverty that they face. Jacqueline, you've just returned from Haiti. What kind of progress have you seen there? Well, I agree with her. A lot of the progress is cosmetic. I mean, the rubble is gone. So if you drive around Port-au-Prince and you're looking for signs of the earthquake, 
um, it's, you're really hard pressed to find them. But when we talk about the fact that there are 1.5 million people who were homeless, and today that number has been cut down by more than 90 percent, the question I always ask, where did they go? Because we did not build a million homes. In fact, the government itself built about 3,000 new houses, and I recently visited one of those developments, and there are a lot of empty houses. A lot of those people returned to their old neighborhoods. So developmentally speaking, people are still struggling. Um, the amount of jobs that many people thought would have been created have not been created. And when you talk to the average Haitian about whether or not their life is better today than it was five years ago, they tell you no, that it's still the same. But there is some optimism, some hope that things will improve. I think Haiti has benefited from the fact that in the last four years, we have not had another major disaster. But again, we had an earthquake almost five years ago. The country is prone to quakes. We are rebuilding. And the question is whether or not the country is building back better. If there is another tragedy like what we saw in 2010, will we have the same results? Right, Melinda. So you have, you have all this money, billions of dollars going into aid relief. And there's a point you just made a moment ago. That money is not going through the Haitians, or the majority of the bulk of that money is not going right. through the Haitians. It's going through other organizations. So in a respect, Haiti doesn't really have control over its development, its recovery, does it? That's a really good point that you're making, and I think it's important for people to understand that there were about $10 billion in pledges of relief after the earthquake. Not all of that has been delivered, of course. Out of the $1.38 billion that our government has given to Haiti, less than 1% of it has gone through Haiti's government or organizations on the ground, and over 50% of it has gone through Beltway contractors, so organizations, corporations based here in the D.C. area. Um, I think that, you know, when you look at what could have been done with those funds, it's really tragic. And um, Jacqueline pointed out something very important. When we talk about success of recovery efforts, we talk about people moving out of displacement camps. Um, and even the United States really fell very short of its goal in terms of housing. We only built about 7,000 new houses, uh, repaired 27,000. And when you're talking about 1.5 million people homeless, that's it's barely a drop in the bucket. Jacqueline, where does Haiti go to from here? Because international donors, of course, will be looking at some kind of stability in the country before they pour in more money. Um, what happens to the country? Is there recognition on the part of the international community that not much progress has been made and something serious needs to be done now? Well, there has been some discussions in the international community in terms of Haitian ownership. You, you're hearing a lot of that now as opposed to in the days after the quake. But let me just also make the point, a figure that I had pointed out in a story that I did shortly after, that the average person in one of those tent cities, it costs $1,500 a year to basically keep them alive. And we were talking about water and sanitation. That was the reason a lot of people did not want to leave those tent cities. So it's very expensive. When you think about where Haiti started, then this disaster happened, and then you think about the money that was pledged and what actually came down, it really was not a lot. As for where does Haiti go, I think the biggest challenge today is the elections. It's been almost four years, and the elections are delayed, and that's what the international community is focused on, because we could very well be on the fifth anniversary of this earthquake, a situation where it's not really fully democratic, where you have a president um, that's sort of ruling by decree because there is no parliament, because the elections have not happened. And that is, right now, the challenge for the Haitian people, the Haitian government, and for the donors who are looking at this country and figuring out what next. Melinda, that's an important part of Haiti's recovery, isn't it? Political stability, because, you know, there have been demonstrations against the government, people calling the government corrupt, saying that there's judicial corruption, uh, there's corruption in the whole recovery process as well. So they do need some kind of political recovery before economic recovery, I guess. Well, it is very important for the Haitian government to make a move around elections. And Jacqueline just mentioned this. And there have been um, missed opportunities for elections just in the last four or five years. Uh, the United States government, which has been very supportive of the Martelli administration in Haiti, has not put enough emphasis, I think, on this question of elections. And so on the one hand, we see how important it would be for funds to go through the Haitian government to build institutions that could really change the situation on the ground. At the same time, there's this concern that the government isn't making an effort, as Jacqueline said, to be truly democratic and to hold elections on times. And so, you know, how do you balance those? Is there a way for us to work with local and municipal governments in Haiti? Is there a way to get aid, you know, into the, into the institutions? I don't think it's possible, and I think we're at a juncture now where there's going to be some serious 
conversations about why haven't there been elections and what will it mean if the government's ruling by decree in 2015. Okay, ladies, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us on the show. That is all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show for that matter. Chat with us on Twitter at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.